Hello there. Welcome to this episode of Lifestyle Matters. I'm Savina, and once again, I'm joined by Fergal Armstrong on this episode. Welcome, Fergal. So I thought this episode would talk about, a uh, sort of continue from our last conversation on social connectivity. Um, and I guess, firstly, to start off with, how would we define social connection? And for me, my take on it is the fact that that feeling of connectedness to others where you don't actually feel alone. Um, and they, you may not, it may not have to be a physical connection, like someone needs to be present right next to you. It could be someone at a distance, but yet you feel connected to that person. Um, what is your take on social connection, Virgo? So I think it's important to understand just how important social connectedness is. And, you know, I, I love quotations. So a couple of quotations I wanted to share with you today, right? So Mother Teresa said this, being unwanted, unloved, uncared for, forgotten by everybody, I think that that is a much greater hunger, a much greater poverty than the person who has nothing to eat. The Dalai Lama also said that love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. So I think that puts into context just the, just how important socialization, social connectedness is. So, Savina, do you have any ideas as to how we can actually help people improve their social connectedness? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess what I'd like to is sort of even just start off with is the fact that, you know, we I think a lot of us take social connections for granted. It comes naturally to some but not to everyone. And, you know, there there could be medical reasons for it, like social anxiety disorder, um, or agoraphobia. But, you know, it may not necessarily become a medical label, but still it's just hard to actually sometimes just connect with someone. Um, and it can be quite stressful, um, especially, and I have found that actually quite a bit more prevalent since we've come out of lockdowns and things like that. My, even my patients who are in their 60s or 70s who've had, you know, great vast friendship circles, connected with people before and had no issues, now are struggling to redevelop the skills again. Um, and it is, it is, I guess, an important thing to to highlight because what worries me is that there are lots of people out there who might be sort of just living alone at home, not connecting with anyone else and neglecting their well-being. So I think that was one point I really wanted to highlight, um, that it is not easy for everyone. What you're saying is that we're getting out of practice. We haven't, we've lost that skill. We have, we have. Some have lost it, not everyone has, um, and some get it back easily, but not everyone does. No. Now, there are, no. when we talk, we look at social connections, there are three types of social connections broadly that we can sort of divide it into. The, well, the, the intimate ones, the relational ones, and the collective ones. So intimate ones are basically like your friends and family that you have love. Um, and careful um, that they're your immediate sort of circle. Relational would be people like your workmates, um, your colleagues um, that you see on your daily routine, um, and that they could be part of that sort of social connectivity. And then you've got the collective people who, you know, if you are a church goer or if you go to, you know, any places of worship or if you go to the, the fuel station, for example, they are part of people that you would see frequently but they might be sort of yeah. like in that outer distance against and once again that social connectivity in these different different layers so the other part that i think is really important for us to know is the importance of building social re- connections from infancy itself what we found is that people who've actually had a good strong emotional connection with their parents from the from their infancy stage actually that tra- helps to translate it to a better self-esteem as they go into teen years as which we know can be quite trying it gives them good self-esteem and allows them to um, mingle and build social relationships outside. So it's not just about, you know, as adults trying to build social connectivity. It actually starts from infancy itself. Now that we've discussed really the whole underlying one of what, why it's so important, how can we actually improve social connectivity, Fergal? Would you like to take us through that a bit? So the, look, there are lots of tips which we can go through, but I think it's really important to emphasize compassion and pride. When we are compassionate to our fellow man, 
when we are kind to our fellow man, that allows us to connect with, with our fellow man and that, that allows us to engage in social connectivity. And the opposite of that is pride. When we feel superior to people or, you know, or when we come over as judgy or prideful, that's a complete no-no and that's just going to destroy any social connection we might have with someone. So I think we need to understand that we're all vulnerable children deep down and it doesn't matter how important we are, we still need friends. We still need people to connect to. And I often think of um, you know, the, the animal kingdom when I'm thinking about this. So I remember this story about this thoroughbred racehorse who nearly starved itself to death because the racehorse missed its best friend, who was a little tiny Shetland pony that he was uh, you know, being adjusted with in the same field. So we have on the one hand a horse that is worth millions, you know, thoroughbred, whose life, his very life depended on a relationship with another little pony. So the point I take to make, the, the point I make with that is that it doesn't matter how important we are, or at least how important we think we are, we always need to reach out to people in a spirit of compassion and without any pride. And I think along those lines, you know, you talk about the compassion um, and pride. I think the other important important thing with that would be communication. I think communication is so important too. If you don't communicate well, you know, you don't express how you're feeling to another person, um, how will they know how mm. you feel? You know, other, And that will just lead to more assumptions and that will just cause more issues in terms of, building that social relationship. So I think communication is also another important um, tool to have to improve this. So there are a number of tips that we can talk about in terms of helping people improve their ability to socialize. Would you like to go through a few of them? Yeah. So I think that one of the things that I'd like to, you know, the, one of the first important things that come to the forefront right now is actually being adaptable to change, <laughs> given everything that we've been going through in the last few right. years. You know, it's being adaptable to change. Always expect change. You know, we as humans, we tend to sort of be mm. reliant on patterns. We like patterns. It makes us feel safe and comfortable. And we know that. But if we actually can set our minds to say, look, we expect change. Change is always going to be, you know, not always good, but most of the times it can be good, especially if you try to make it work for you. It becomes easier for you to actually then mm. build relationships also. So, you know, like I remember, oh gosh, I had a best friend when I was a, a teen. Like we spent, you know, at school, we were talking forever on the phone. We'd come home. I'm sorry, at school, we'd be talking all the time. Once we come home, we'll be on the phone all the time. And my parents would be like, what are you doing? What else do you have to talk about? But she was my best friend. She was my best friend throughout high school the whole time. Um, we went to uni. We were still con communicated. And now we've lost touch but you know and then you just reflect and you think look you know what that friendship was there it lasted it did well served its purpose not feeling any bitterness towards it it's just that now we've changed we've evolved change happens we've got different lives and that's how and we build new relationships further down the track and i think that's such an important thing to have because otherwise i could be sitting here moping thinking i've lost a friend which is not true because, you know, you still can pick up the phone if you want to, but life happens. On that note, I, I often reflect on, on, on my past relationships with people. And, you know, when, when, as you say, lives move on, people evolve. I sometimes feel guilty about the fact that I haven't reached out to someone in my, with whom I had a relationship in the past. But then I reflect, well, they haven't reached out to me either. And neither of us are particularly upset. So, yeah. you know, we'll probably just let bygones be bygones. But, you know, in the spirit of, of, of increasing social connectivity rather than celebrating the loss of it, you know, there are, there, you know, there are other tips apart from expecting change. I mean, one of, one of the things I always like to emphasize is we have two ears on one mouth. And actually, we should focus on listening to what other people are saying. Listen to what they say and reflect back about what they've said before we actually introduce our own issue or our own agenda. What would you say to that? So essentially, I think what we have to do is, you know, we've, as you said, we've got two ears and one mouth. Always allow, you know, you can say what you have to say, but also give, you know, double the time if you have to, to listen to what someone actually has to say. You never know what, what might come out. And if you give them enough time, things will be said. Um, and I think it's 
how we also respond to what someone tells us is also really important, you know. So maybe, you know, verbal cues or nonverbal cues. So your body language, yeah. your facial expressions um, are important as to how you respond to someone when you listen to them. So I think giving a listening ear to someone is really important. Yeah, that that's so true. That the concept of active listening, you know, it's not just about hearing what people say. It's about interpreting their, their non-visual cues their body language, their, their mood, their demeanor. That's so important then because, you know, the, there is much more nuanced meaning from body language, et cetera, than there is actually in the words that people say. And it really does help if we can reflect on that as well. I mean, I often think about um, one of the ways of demonstrating response, responsiveness or true listening skills is uh, two things. One is, is providing a reflection and two is affirming what is said. So if someone's saying, you know, that they're suffering, the affirmation of suffering is so uh, powerful. It, it, it engenders a significant connection between people. And also likewise, the affirmation of success and being able to reflect and also give it a, a, a one's own personal twist. These are skills that allow us to demonstrate that we have truly understood our, the person that we are listening to. So it is, it is a skill and I think also um, one of my old mentors when I was in the Wales working as a GP, he said to me that you need to practice getting rid of your internal dialogue. So when you're listening to someone, you need to pay absolute attention to them, look them in the eye and watch them and listen to them and get rid of all the thoughts about, you know, oh, I wonder what's for dinner tonight or, you know, worrying about the fight that you had with your wife earlier on that day. All those thoughts that, that you might be th- that you that might cause your attention to wander, let them go. Get rid of it and focus on the person that you are listening to. And actually, you will find that other people, your audience, will pick up on that. And this process of what I call active listening, which includes getting rid of internal dialogue, actually increases the the the, the flow of information and will allow you to actually improve your social connectivity with others. In terms of charisma, charisma has been studied by various social psychologists, by various social psychologists, and the, the removal of internal dialogue is one of those key skills that very charismatic people work on. And the other one is actually eye contact and reduced blinking rate. But that's what some of the, some of the great charismatic actors of this world have done. They they deliberately reduce their blink rate. But active listening and getting rid of it, internal dialogue is the first step to really letting someone feel as if that person is the most important person in the world to you as you are listening to them. That eye contact, the eye contact for that person. Yeah. And also saying that using their names when you're talking to them, yeah. especially when you're meeting someone new, it just, you know, it just sort of basically helps to sort of put a personal yeah. touch to it yeah. when you're actually listening to them or talking to them too. Yeah. I just wanted to actually add in one more thing, you know, what your 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 mentor said was really important. And I'm going to extrapolate from that into the modern world these days that we live in where we're always connected with our phone, going out, socializing, going out for dinner with your friends, sitting at the table, everyone puts their phone on the table and, you know, you're on your phone messaging or doing whatever it is you need to do on social media. I think you know, that takes away that social connectivity too because you're sort of thinking, well, I think there was a TED Talk on this. Um, I'm watching it and it's about that the interpretation is that you're not worth my time and, and so I need to multitask with my phone and you physically. I mean, that's still one interpretation, I guess. But what I'm trying to say here is really, you know, go offline when you can. And that's the main thing um, because, you know, that person in front of you, it's so important. Yes. Yeah. Remove both the internal and the external dialogue these days. Yeah, yeah. it shows my yeah. age that I or that when I learned this, <laughs> it was all about internal dialogue. There was no external dialogue when I was being taught this. <laughs> How the world has changed. Yeah. I guess now what I find people, especially these days, is also just advice that we would give, give people when they try to go back out to the world, connecting to others. Um, you know, that fear, their anxiety about connecting with others. What sort of advice can we give in those scenarios? Well, firstly, as frightened as you might be, the other person is probably just as frightened. 
right? And secondly, if they're not frightened, then they're probably very skillful at putting you at your ease, and they would be grateful either way of that reaching out to you. It's it's you know it's very unusual for people to punish others for for reaching out. It's, I, I, it's very very unreason un, unusual. Secondly, you've got to have enough self confidence to actually want to reach out, and so we really you need to actually cultivate positive emotions. Because it does take energy to reach out. It's so much easier just to hunch down and walk past someone or ignore someone, you know. But if you can actually start thinking about positivity and the benefits of socialization and your own internal self-worth, that will start to give you the, the, the emotional energy to reach out. And thirdly, practice. And it comes down to that self-esteem that exactly. I was talking about. Yeah. Do you want to talk about self-esteem then? Yeah. Well, I guess, no, is this what I wanted to say, just going back to the point what I was making about self-esteem, you know, if when you've got that, if you've always been exposed to a positive environment, well, been exposed to a positive environment, built good, good social relationships since you were young, and that's what you're used to, then you have more self-confidence to go out there and make those, build those relationships. Um, and I guess that's the main point that I wanted to make about that, yeah. really. So if I could just go back to this idea of practicing, being able to make chit-chat with people is actually an acquired skill. Uh, so, you know, the, the short answer is you just got to keep doing it. Practice, 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 practice. And I think one of the key tips is to 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 want to know someone, to, 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 enca to engage in a dialogue, to, to engage in active listening. You have to be interested in the person you're talking to. So ask them open-ended questions. And keep practicing your drill, you know, keep practicing, you know, the, 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 the ideas, the concerns, the expectations you might want to elicit from someone to then allow that flow of communication. Yeah. And also the other tip I would have with that is also to have a few, especially if you're going to a new environment, you're meeting new people, have a few topics of conversation that you might have, you know, mm. general things, just for small chit chat, yeah. as trying as it may be. If you keep doing yeah. it, as you said, practice, yeah. it becomes easier. Yeah. So if you've got like some preformed questions yeah. or conversations to have. And of course, if you don't yeah. want to, if you don't want to practice these skills on people you're going to meet for the first time, you can always reach out to people that you've known in the past and fall them out of touch with a little bit. You can practice on your old friends before you practice on anyone new. You know, that's the other way of doing it. You can also reach out to your old buddies. Reconnect that old friends of yours. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. And I suppose, yeah, why not? Indeed. Um, and the other thing is also when you're feeling anxious about going out and meeting new people and talking to them, <clears throat> sometimes our heart rate can start increasing. You can have troubles breathing. You might have your head just running a million miles an hour. And I think that's more about just trying to sort of practice this relaxation yeah. strategies. There are lots of websites these days out there. Yeah. Um, that, you know, go through relaxation strategies. Um, so have a look at those, pick up a few skills and then try to use them when you feel anxious so that when you're going out and socializing, you can just easily fall back to that yeah. should you need to. Um, and that will also help to improve your self-confidence levels too when you've got those tools and you're under your belt so that you know, right, if something happens, I've got a plan, plan B. So we've gone through a yeah. number of tips, but if you could summarize, what would be the most important uh, point for you to, to give to people on this subject? So I think for me, the most important point in trying to build social relationships, I think it comes down to the first few things that we talked about. I think self-compassion is really important, which comes with self-esteem. And communication for me is also a really important thing. Like if you don't tell someone what, how you're feeling or what it is you're thinking about, they will not, they're not mind readers. They will not know. Yeah. Um, and get help if you struggle with anxiety because that will be the other cornerstone of it. For me, that's my take on how I would sort of yeah. try to build social relationships. What would yours be, Pearl? Mine would be don't forget the racehorse and the pony. Everybody needs friends. Okay. <laughs> that is true. Everybody does do need to. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, Virgo. Always a pleasure. Thanks for watching this episode of Lifestyle Matters. Till next time. See you then.